I would love to see more of the Nightingale and, and the common projects to come on board, not only in Brunswick, but um, to take a leaf out of the book for other, other architects and other uh, areas to take that on. Um, one, for affordability, but two, sustainability and how important that is long term uh, to, to Melbourne, Victoria and, and so on. But not many are taking this on because they, f they feel developers know that there's not a lot of money in it for them. So again, they're looking at their hip pocket to say, well, we're not making money out of this. Why should we take this on board? We don't want the people who are least able to afford to live in Brunswick to be living in dog boxes. Um, and that's what happens when you have um, these really tiny apartments where you can't stick your arms out to either side without touching the walls. Um, I've seen apartments come through Urban Planning Committee where the kitchen is an alcove in the hallway that leads from the front door. It's just a sink and a little room for a fridge. We as a council want to be pushing developers to build better apartments all the time um, so that you're not leaving, you know, the real bottom rung apartments to those people who can't afford anything better. Despite the fact that it's pretty early days, you know, across the road from where we're sitting at the moment, it's really the first works on site that are occurring for a, for a Nightingale model project. And, and there'll be 20 apartments delivered there and there'll be 20 apartments delivered at our project in Fairfield. But despite that, we've got, you know, upwards of 1,300 people sitting on a database um, or on a waiting list, really, who have expressed, actively expressed their interest in living in one of these apartments. Nightingale is a much larger phenomenon at the moment on paper than it is physical. Uh, Nightingale 1 is currently under construction in Brunswick, um, which is such a critical case study, but each one is an evolution of the past. So at the moment there's um, Jeremy McLeod from Breathe is uh, the leader of, uh, lead architect and facilitator of Nightingale 1. Nightingale 2 is in Fairfield and that's going through a planning battle at the moment because of sort of a lack of understanding around what it's delivering. And Nightingale 3 is currently being lodged to planning in the city of Moreland. Uh, by Andrew Maynard Architects. Uh, Nightingale 4 is currently looking for a site with Claire Cousins and there's maybe uh, another six or seven that have received licensing that are starting to go through the process of, of finding sites, finding finance. So from a sort of uh, drop in the ocean phenomenon, and we're still talking about a very small proportion of total development activity, but you have this immense groundswell that's occurring in a really short period of time because you can start to see this is partly about the environmental and community aspirations, but it's an economically rational process. It allows people to co-create and co-invest in projects for community good and it makes financial sense. So it becomes a kind of uh, a soft green movement, I guess you could call it, uh, whilst being concurrently aspirational but very realistic and very um, practical and pragmatic. So the developers are the ones that have to um, see the light at the end of the tunnel to know that the way that people are thinking and feeling and connecting is not about dollars. It's about space and it's about the sustainability and it's about the community and having the common areas and in interacting with the communities and who you're living um, next to. So I think Nightingale is, is, is really critical um, to, for governments to sort of facilitate as an, as an early tentative move towards full development cooperatives, towards joint ventures between affordable housing providers and market providers, um, starting to rethink the way we shape housing. You'll all, always have that percentage of people that want to be part of the ethical and the sustainability side of an aspect of things where you have majority of people sort of going well why would I want to be part of that when I can have this product and have all the mod cons they're not caring about the environment and everything else at the moment they're thinking well this is this is a good deal I'll stick with this so I think it's about educating um, the investors and the crowdfunded you know, people that are in there and bringing that beyond. And they're doing a great job. They're doing a great job at the moment with that, but I think it just needs to go to that next level. And how that's going to happen, I don't know. How can you imagine a future where these issues are being addressed and in a way that also provides other benefits, for example? So, you know, if you figure out how Melbourne can operate in a way that's far less car dependent and makes much greater use of riding and walking and trams and trains and buses, what other benefits does that have? It makes streets safer, it gives uh, improvements to air quality, people are going to be healthier living that kind of lifestyle. There's, there's dangers in just thinking about the future end state. The process is really important as well, but I also think not settling for a small change in the next five years as being the end point, more seeing that idea of a real fundamental transformation as being um, something to be embraced.
how an ethical city relates to a livable city, uh, I'd like to think that uh, one leads the other, that an ethical city is what generates livability. So we need to have the conversations around, as we've discussed, what an ethical city is, and maybe we can reframe our indicators around uh, social capital and well-being and the community self-determination as indicators of what livability might be. The challenges of and, and the scale of the change that's required to respond to, to really chunky issues like climate change. At times we sort of settle into the idea that sort of iterative change will, will suffice. So, we'll, you know, we'll make little changes here and little changes there and we'll, we'll, we'll get there. But the sooner that we kind of realise that and embrace that idea of large scale, fast transformational change, the better we'll be off long term.